pleasure to be here to present some of the uh, latest research coming out of, Signal, of, our, of our labs at Signal Biosciences. Um, <clears throat> to, in terms of conflict of interest, to disclose uh, myself as well as the colleagues of mine who contributed data to this presentation that are being presented here are all either Signal employees and or consultants and some of the clinical data that we're presenting here, uh, we were the study sponsor and the work was done at an independent CRO. Um, so just to get things started off, um, all G proteins, be it small G proteins like, uh, like RAS depicted here or the large heterotrimeric G protein couple receptors that are anchored in the cellular membrane contain a, a cat's tail motif, a CAX motif that is prenylated specifically at the cysteine residue either by a farnesyl, cell, a C15 lipid tail or a journal, journal C20 lipid tail. Um, and it's, it recognizes this CAX motif. Um, studying G-protein signaling uh, in Princeton in the early 90s, Dr. Jeffrey Stock, who is a co-founder of, of Signal Biosciences, um, generated isoprenyl cysteine mimetics, or IPCs for, for short, uh, looking at how these proteins were interacting and binding with each other and how they were triggering inflammation. And he found that the mimetics themselves had anti-inflammatory activity, and he published some of this work in a series of papers in the early 90s. Um, about 15 years later, um, we dis using the archetype of the IPC class, which is N-acetylfarnesyl cysteine, or AFC for short, we were able to demonstrate that applying this compound topically inhibited inflammation, and unlike glucocorticoids, its activity was restricted to the site of application. So IPCs work primarily by binding to pockets located in proteins at the membrane or in the cytoplasm in specific pockets in uh, different G-protein effectors. And this has been shown uh, for small G-proteins like RAS or ACRO, uh, G-protein couple receptors, we've seen this with the purinergics and also FMLPR1, as well as G-protein effectors like phospholipase C. And this is primarily done through that lipid binding tail, although there are a couple of other post-translational modifications that also play a role, maybe get methylated to make it a little bit more hydrophobic, to make it stick in, in the membrane, but primarily it's been shown to be through this C15 or C20 uh, tail. One of the interesting things of the course of, of while we were studying this, specifically with Dr. Richard Granstein at Cornell Weill, um, studying the effects of IPCs with the PY2 receptor was that the IPCs were not just only modulating or inhibiting G-protein coupled receptor signaling of, 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 of inflammation, but also toll-like receptor signaling. So that got us to go back into the lab, think about the chemistry, the, the I, IPC chemical backbone. Um, and what we did is we took the four distinct regions of the molecule and just started generating different um, uh, de derivatives by making uh, modifications to the lipid tail as well as to the carbonyl and the head group and then the sulfur it, itself. And uh, what we found was by screening about, we generated about 1,500 of these compounds in, in a battery of in vitro and in vivo anti-inflammatory assays. We, we were trying to screen for more <coughs> potent anti-inflammatory compounds. But at the same time, um, given that fatty acids are, are known to have antimicrobial uh, properties as well, we were hoping to uncover compounds that had a dual effect, antimicrobial as well as anti-inflammatory activities. So uh, to sum things up through a large screening campaign that took several years, um, what we found was specifically introducing a phytol fatty acid tail um, in, in place of the farnesyl or general general paired with specific modifications to the head group and the carbonyl, generated these dual, mod these dual acting um, IPC phytocysteine compounds that could inhibit TLR2 signaling, TLR4 signaling, and now had antimicrobial activity that the previous Farnesyl and general, general IPCs didn't have. Um, so this, I'm just going to take a quick one slide side point because I think it's relevant to the audience that's here given we're acne and rosacea is our first uh, molecule, our first drug molecule, Sig990, is currently in phase 2A trials uh, for rosacea, 100 subject study, and then we have a smaller PLC 2A study for atopic dermatitis, given some activity, activity we've seen on, against TH2 cytokines. And then um, 
I'll mention 1451 here because it's our, our next generation, we, for lack of a better term, uh, phytocysteine, isoprenocysteine analog. Um, most of this work was, was made possible by funding. I see Dr. Sabati there asking some questions. So NIAMS and NIAD through SBIR funding. Um, and we're presenting a post here. So if anyone's interested in atopic dermatitis and a little bit more about the phytocysteine chemistry, come visit our poster on Saturday. Jumping back into the phytocysteine IPCs and how, they, how they're relevant for, for acne, uh, potentially. Um, in, at the end of 2012, we published a paper showing uh, SIG-1273, which was our first phytocysteine IPC that, that we demonstrated had anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial activity. We showed that it had some anti-acne properties, but what we really hadn't done was really explore the chemical space. So what we did is we set up a screening paradigm looking for um, antimicrobial activity as well as anti-inflammatory activity by measuring MIC, MVC, and then hopefully uh, eradicating P. acne's biofilm formation, and then looking at the anti-inflammatory activity that we thought these IPCs would be able to, to retain, because that's, that's how we discovered them in, in the first place. So uh, we set up the screen and, and had essentially a medicinal chemistry uh, program where we put them through the initial screen, get some SAR, make some other modifications, and then go back at it again. And this effort yielded uh, two leads, SIG-1459 and SIG-1460. Here I've just summarized briefly because I know we've got to keep it to 10 minutes. We have this as a poster as well, so I'm happy to dive into a lot of the, uh, the details of the experiments. Uh, uh, tomorrow while we present this poster, but just um, quickly, um, SIG 1459 and 60 showed strong MIC, um, single digit micromolar uh, bactericidal effects, as well as, as I mentioned, they were able to eradicate um, biofilm formation in vitro, uh, you know, clearly outperforming benzoyl peroxide, azelaic acid, and then we ran clindamycin obviously as a positive control, assuming it would be the most potent, and it was. Um, Building upon the antimicrobial uh, activity, 1459 and 1460 also were shown to inhibit P. acne induced inflammation. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, speakers already today have talked about P. acne's triggering TLR2 signaling. So when we treat um, NHEKs with live P. acne's, this triggers an overproduction of IL-8. Uh, we see a nice uh, dose-dependent uh, inhibition of IL-8, and we're seeing really, really low uh, IC50 values, no, low nanomolar concentrations, which is uh, on the order of steroid-like potency. Uh, we then took a specific TLR2 ligand, peptidoglycan or, or PGN, and treated uh, NHEKs. And as, as you can see on, on the bar graph here, we see about a four to five-fold induction of IL-8, and again, 1459 and 60, those dependently inhibit the IL-8 release, again, at uh, IC50 values uh, in the nanomolar range. Um, so to just sum this up, uh, uh, proposed mechanism of action, I think we're still scratching the surface on how exactly these molecules are working, but uh, we're able to uh, potentially have these anti-acne effects by uh, killing or having antibacterial uh, activity against the P-acnes itself, so preventing the triggering of the inflammation. But if the inflammation is triggered, um, we're able to modulate or inhibit TLR2 signaling Interestingly, Dr. Agafa, who just went before us, <laughs> talked about the role of IL-17, and we have shown uh, when we stimulate PBMCs uh, to T-cell receptor induction that we're able to, these molecules are able to inhibit IL-17, and we've shown uh, as well that uh, not just these, three, these couple of specific cytokines, but 1459 and 60 have um, anti-inflammatory anti uh, activity against several Th1 cytokines as well. So I think. This MOA, this, I think this graph will change over the next year or two, but we're, we're, we're just, I think, at the tip of the iceberg on how exactly these molecules are working. Um, so we had two leads, so we, we wanted to select one, pick one as opposed to um, putting two through the study, and we wanted to do two things. Do a proof of concept study in human uh, subjects that with acne prone skin, and as well as uh, perform a clinical tolerance study, you know, where it's going to be any, any adverse effects, it's going to cause any sting, any burn, burning. So we, we set up a 75 subject study, two to one, SIG1459 uh, at 1% in a topical formulation, and then a vehicle arm with 15 subjects, and then a, a, a positive control using BPO at, at 3%. Uh, 
uh, with four site visits. And then uh, the criteria for the subjects to be included in the study was that they had to be either a two or three on the ACNE uh, IGA scale. Uh, one note here I put in italics is the, 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 the groups for, for the positive control and, and the vehicle uh, have been completed, so you'll see an N of 15 here, I think 14 for the vehicles because one person dropped out. Uh, the data I'll be showing you here is for, the 18, is for 18 of the 35 subjects that have completed. 17 are in progress and the clinicals should be finishing at the end of May and then we'll have the whole data set and we'll be able to update um, the results. But from where we are now, um, at least the initial results, a small sample size, uh, caveat aside, um, is, is that it looks like SIG 1459 is performing uh, better than, than BPO uh, when we're applying this topically on, on the skin. So we're seeing uh, over a two-point scale reduction on the IJA scale with SIG 1459, and it's statistically significant over BPO, which is also working. We see a one-and-a-half point reduction on the scale at weeks two and week eight. And interestingly, uh, our vehicle is not very good at all. It actually... Uh, uh, the people on the vehicle got got a little worse, which is probably why one of the person, one of the people, uh, one of the subjects um, dropped out. So this is a uh, really exciting news, and um, I just have a couple of before and afters because I know we want to try and uh, keep this the two minutes uh, following this one slide. So in addition to seeing potentially this this nice proof of concept study and seeing that it's performing better than BPO, um, the one percent C fourteen fifty nine was well tolerated. We didn't see any adverse. Uh, reactions. No one reported anything in the SPQs that have been uh, collected to date. Uh, conversely, as expected, the BPO at 3%, uh, many of the subjects complained of the stinging, the burning, the dryness, and the staining of, of the pillowcases and towels. And what's interesting so far, I think maybe as this end gets up, we'll see a shifting of uh, some decrease and not everyone having a too great uh, improvement. We'll see some populate in the one uh, one grade change in the IGA scale, but I think the initial results are, are really promising and we're uh, really excited to finish to get the final results by the end of next month. So just a couple of, of quick before and after photos, as I mentioned, it might be a little harder to see here. Um, we see a nice clearing of, of the acne in the forehead, the nose and the chin area. It's a, it's a little easier to see on, on the laptops um, than here on these big screens. I'm not sure if it's going to come out here, but this ties into potentially the, the, the antimicrobial activity. So um, when, when, we, uh, when you take photos in UV light, you can, you can visualize uh, porphyrins, which are natural organic compounds that are released by, by acne. They usually come up as a red or orange fluorescence. So I'm not sure how well it shows there. But over time, we're seeing this in many of the subjects. We're seeing a, a reduction in the, in the fluorescence that's triggered by these, by these porphyrins, which is an indirect measure and suggests that the antimicrobial activity that we're seeing uh, in vitro is also, we're also visualizing that on the skin. But again, more uh, subjects to come. So with that, um, I'd just like to summarize um, the main points here. Phytocystin compounds, 1459 and 60, uh, dose-dependently in inhibit P. acne and PGN uh, cytokine release, which is triggered by TLR2. Um, they have antimicrobial activity, inhibiting P. acne growth, demonstrating antibactericidal uh, activity, and blocking biofilm formation. Uh, the 1% topical formulation is well tolerated and appears to be effective uh, clinically. And we believe that um, IPCs, this, this is a, a novel technology platform that could have many applications for skin. We're seeing these phytocysteine compounds here active uh, potentially for acne. SIG-1451, which is our drug lead uh, for atopic dermatitis, is also a phytocysteine IPC. And we also have the IPC that we are, it's in phase two clinical trials now for rosacea. So we're really excited and we'll continue to mine and, and this chemistry to find uh, additional compounds that could be beneficial for skin disease. Um, so with that, just acknowledgments, our team at Signum Biosciences, uh, the scientists that um, contributed to this work, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Stock at Princeton University, and as I mentioned, um, NIAMS and NIAID who, who supported our, our work on the SIG 990, the rosacea grant, and also the atopic dermatitis uh, drug grant. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have uh, time for uh, one or two questions. It's a very interesting approach. I was just wondering, uh, are you seeing any development of resistance in either P. acnes or any, uh, any other organisms? 
to date, we haven't seen any resistance. Um, what's interesting is uh, uh, phytanic acid, uh, which is one of the starting materials of these phytocysteines, uh, have been previously uh, reported to have um, antimicrobial activity as well. So I think we're still struggling with how exactly these are working, but I think they're just they're disrupting the the, the, the bacterial uh, wall and membranes there. So I think the likelihood that they'll develop resistance to to these uh, is, is is low compared to an antibiotic. So do the uh, do the compounds then cross react with other bacteria? Yeah, is 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 is, is my hypothesis, and given the previous literature published on phytanic acid and phytol itself. That was my question, actually, and does it work on Staph aureus, for example? You didn't check. Uh, I'm sorry, Staph aureus? Staph aureus, for example. So we checked against Staph aureus. It does not, uh, it does not kill Staph aureus. Um, it, it'll, it, 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 you'll, we've published uh, in the poster on, on the other phytocysteine. We're able to inhibit Staph aureus induced inflammation. Uh, so Staph aureus will trigger TSLP. We're able to knock on TSLP. But the, the, these particular compounds, this generation right now, doesn't um, kill Staph aureus. We'll continue to do additional medicinal chemistry to see if we can discover IPCs that can kill Staph aureus. And one more question. Thank you for a nice talk. Um, are the actions of these molecules specific to TLR2, or are there other TLRs that they could potentially be affecting if those studies have been done? Thank you. Yep. Um, we've done testing. Um, None of them are agonists to any of the TLRs. Um, we have seen dif differing effects depending on which phytocysteine and the Farnesyl cysteine compounds on different TLRs, but uh, I'm not at liberty to sh share that information. But there are differing effects, and some interact with a specific subset of TLRs, and then other different chemistries all interact with a different subset, if, if that helps a little bit. Okay, thank you. Thanks.